Welcome to the first part of lecture number 24, Student Teacher Distributions with Two Populations. Now, as a recap, the basic assumption behind student teacher distributions is that your data has a normal approximation and that there's a single population that you're dealing with. Now, a normal approximation is a pretty good assumption due to the central limit theorem. With a normal approximation, you have a mean and standard deviation. If you know the mean and standard deviation, you don't need to use a t-test. Just use a normal approximation. And for example, you can calculate the probability that sum of 10 six-sided dice is greater than 39.5. In the case of dice, for example, I know what the mean is. I know what the standard deviation is. So I know what the answer is going to be. What I'll do is calculate how far 39.5 is from the mean in terms of standard deviation. That's called the z-score. Then I'll find the area of the tail using a standard normal table. Now that's if you know the mean and standard deviation. A student t-test is very similar, but instead of using the known mean and standard deviation, I estimate them based upon n measurements. Uh, but again, it's pretty similar to a normal distribution. I assume a single population. I assume a normal probability density function just with an unknown mean, unknown standard deviation. And with a single t-test, I can do things like find the probability that a gain of a 3904 transistor is bigger than 300. I can find the 90% confidence intervals. I can figure out what player A's going to be, score is going to be in a game of Hungry Hungry Hippo. Well, what happens if you have two populations? For example, I might want to know, is June warmer than July, or vice versa? If you have two players playing Hungry Hungry Hippo, who's going to win the next game? If I have two batches of transistors, which one has the higher gain? And essentially what you have, again from the central limit theorem, I've got two populations. They both have a mean, have a standard deviation. I want to know actually one of two things. If I play one more game, what's the probability that A will be bigger than B? There's a second question. If I had an infinite game series, who would win, A or B? Meaning, who's got the actual higher average? Well, that's a student t-test when you have two populations. The solution is to force the problem to fit the solution. Student t-distributions assume you have a single population, so create one. Create a new variable w that's the difference between a minus b. Now w will have a normal distribution if you knew the mean and standard deviation. Since you don't know them and you have to estimate them, w has a student t-distribution. The parameters for w will be the mean of w is just the mean of a minus mean of b, since you're subtracting. The variance of w will be the sum of the two. And this is where you add, you don't subtract. If you did subtract, conceptually I could have a negative variance, which is nonsense. The variance is actually add. And that kind of, if you think about it, I've got A and B. Get my drawing pen to work. There we go. Okay, so I've got population a and b they both have the mean have a standard deviation when i take a minus b i could have a large a and a small b so the spread actually increases and that shows up here i add the variances now there's actually two different types of standard deviations for an individual or population an individual would say if i play one more game who's going to win a or b that'd be this number right here a population would say, well, A's got an average, B has an average. If I played an infinite game series, who would win? Who has the higher average? That'd be the standard deviation or the variance for a population. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. There's also degrees of freedom. It's actually this formula. Uh, roughly, it's just the minimum of degrees of freedom of A and B. This isn't exact, but it doesn't have a huge impact on the probabilities. Use either one. I personally prefer this one. It gets better intuition. But technically, this is how you calculate the degrees of freedom. And again, mentioned individuals versus populations. An individual would be, if I play one more game, who's going to win? Population is 
if I had an infinite series, he was going to win. Now with individuals, the sample size doesn't really affect the standard deviation. I've got a spread. This is A minus B. Uh, sometimes A does well, sometimes A does poorly. There's going to be fairly widespread. On the other hand, uh, A has a mean, B has a mean. If you had an infinite game series, eventually somebody's going to win, or the better team will win for infinite series. So here's the number zero. If A is better than B, on average this is to the right, if you have an infinite game series, this squeezes down. And what you wind up with is kind of this distribution. The standard deviation gets smaller. As the sample size goes to infinity, all I'll know for sure is W bigger than zero or less than zero. So for populations, sample size does matter. For individuals, it doesn't really matter. And we'll see that in a sec. Uh, to do that, let's look at a couple different cases. Let's compare uh, July versus August. Let's look at the temperature. Was the first two 20 years, or was the last 20 years warmer than the 50s through 70s? I'll look at a batch of transistors. Does batch A have a higher gain than batch B? Or reflex times? I can ask questions like, do I have re faster reflexes time in the morning or afternoon? These are things you can do with a t-test with two populations. So let's kind of illustrate that. If you go to Hector Airport, it's been recording temperatures in Fargo since 1942. I've got two months. I've got the average temperature for each month, the standard deviation, and sample size. And this is kind of what the distributions look like. Now, to analyze this, I've got two populations. What I'll do is create a new variable w that's a minus b. When I do that, the mean of w is just the mean of a minus mean of b, plus 1.95. The standard deviation will be the square root of sa squared plus sb squared, and the degrees of freedom is just the minimum of these two, be 80 degrees of freedom. Now this is for an individual. In other words, what I'm saying is, this very next year, will July be warmer than August in this year? Well, this says based upon the data, the mean of W is plus 1.95, so on average it is. Not always, but on average it is. Here's zero. To find out what this area is, I find out how far zero is from the mean in terms of standard deviations. Since I'm estimating these from the data, it's a t-test rather than a normal test. So doing that, here's my t-score. How far is zero from the mean in terms of standard deviations? is 0 0.5330 standard deviations. Now using a t-table with 80 degrees of freedom, that corresponds to probability of 70%. So again, here's your w a minus b. The mean is 1.95. Here is zero. Uh, this area is 70%. This area is 30%. So based upon the data from Hector Airport, 70% of the time, July will be warmer than August. 30% uh, August is actually warmer than July. It does happen. That's kind of comparison of means with two populations. Now that was for an individual year, say this year. Suppose I want to know a different question. Which is the hotter month, July or August? So if I had an infinite number of data points, July would have an average, August would have an average. Which one is bigger? Now for populations, I know more about populations than individuals. Sample size comes into play. Since I'm talking about an a, a population, when I calculate the variance, I divide by the sample size for A and B. When I do that, the mean stays the same, just A minus B. The standard deviation changes by the square root of sa uh, sample size, where the variance drops the sample size, takes the square root. Now what I have is I've got my W distribution, you know, same as before. On average, July is 1.95 degrees warmer than August. Zero is over here. The distance to zero is 1.95 over 0.4. That's my T-score. 
So now my t-score is 4.79. I can do it this way, or equivalently, another way of doing it. If I go to a t-table with 80 degrees of freedom, this t-score corresponds to a probability of 99.999%. That's basically one, it's off the chart. Uh, it's not actually one, it's just rounded up to one. So it's over 99.999% certain that July is warmer than August on average. And again, notice I know more about populations than individuals. For an individual year, this is what the distributions look like. I could have a cold July and a warm August. On any given year, there's a chance August is warmer than July. That's about 30%. For the populations, the standard deviation drops as grew to sample size, so these squeeze down. And eventually, if the sample size is big enough, I can see very clearly. I don't know what the average temperature is in August, but it's somewhere in this region. I don't know the average temperature in July, but it's somewhere in this region, most likely. If I have a big enough sample size, I can separate these two, and I can be very, very certain that July actually is a warmer month. Can you know more about populations than individuals? How about another question? Is Fargo getting warmer? Well, if you go to Hector Airport, they've been saving data for since 1942, about 80 years of data. Let's check. Let's take the first 20 years or 21 years of data, 1942 to 1962. Let's take the last 21 years of data. Is B warmer than A? Well, to do that, I take the data, find the mean, find the standard deviation, degrees of freedom of sample size minus one, repeat for B, and here's what the distributions look like. And you kind of see that, well, on any given year, I could have a cold B, warm A. Uh, some years in population A are warmer than some years in population B. In terms of populations though, I squeeze these down by the square root of sample size, and maybe B is actually significantly warmer than A. Let's find out. For an individual t-test, such as pick a year at random, first 20 years, year at random, last 20 years, what's the chance that one of those years A is going to be bigger than B? So again, what you do is you form a new variable W, that's A minus B. The mean of W is just the mean of A minus mean of B. Uh, it's minus 1.98. The standard deviation is the sum of the variances square root. Here's zero. The t-score is how far is zero from the mean in terms of standard deviations. So over here, this is the probability that A is bigger than B. We're getting colder. This is the probability that A is less than B. We're getting warmer. Calculating the t-score is 0.74. From StatTrack, with 20 degrees of freedom, that's 23%. So, with your W distribution, I've got zero right here. This tail is 23%. There's a 23% chance that any given year, in the first 20 years, will be warmer than the last 20 years. There is a 77% chance that the last 20 years are warmer. Well, any individual year in the last 20 years is warmer. That's an individual test. Population test. Um, suppose I want to know, on average, is Fargo getting warmer? Now, on average is a population question. When I'm dealing with populations, the variance drops as the sample size. So in that case, when I calculate the variance, now the variance is 0.29. So what, what I'm looking at is minus 1.98 degrees. And that is quite a few standard deviations away from zero. Uh, calculating that, that's your t-score. The distance to zero is 6.7 standard deviations. Uh, that's basically 99.999% or more. So again, I know more about populations than, on, than individuals. Any given year might be warmer in the first 20 years 
But with 21 years of data, I can say with almost certainty that Fargo is getting warmer. The last 20 years are statistically, the difference is statistically significant. I can see it. So that's kind of the idea behind a t-test with two populations. Now with t-tests, you can start asking some interesting questions. Like I can start asking, are polyester film capacitors polarized? Are electrolytic capacitors polarized? Does temperature affect capacitance? I could ask other questions such as, do loud noises affect my reaction time? Is my reaction time affected by two drinks? Does using alcohol-free gas improve my gas mileage? Uh, does adding a lid to a coffee cup keep the contents warm? Does adding a spoon make it cool off faster? And so on and so on. All sorts of questions you can ask. With a student t-test, you can answer them. So let's do a couple examples of that. Suppose I want to know, are polyester carbon or are polyester film capacitors polarized? So what I did is take 10 polyester film capacitors. Uh, it's got the label on the front. So this would be a 394, 390 nanofarads. I'll call this uh, forward polarized, that's A. Reverse polarized, put it in backwards. To measure the capacitance, I put this in a 555 timer circuit to convert it to a square wave. The frequency, put on the frequency, I can calculate C. Frequency I can measure very accurately. With a pick marker controller, I can measure time to 100 nanoseconds. So I'm getting um, actually about six decimal places of accuracy. So that's kind of the experiment. I'll stick 10 of these in a circuit, measure the frequency, calculate the capacitance with the forward and reverse polarity. Collect the data and record the mean standard deviation sample size. Well, when I do that, again, same trick, I've got my data for A, mean standard deviation sample size, sample size for B, take the capacitor and flip it, mean standard deviation sample size the difference is minus 0.1 nanofarad. The standard deviation is either 5.5 for an individual or dividing the variance by the sample size, 1.74 for the population. So what's that mean? Uh, well, do a t-test. How far is zero from the mean in terms of standard deviation? The t-score for an individual is 0 0.02, corresponding to 49%. T-score for the population is minus 0.06, corresponding to 47%. Uh, basically saying, uh, not really. There's basically no, no difference between the polarity, forward and reverse biased. And you can see that in the populations. This is the PDF when forward biased, PDF when reverse biased. It's basically the same. Now here's kind of one point when you collect data. When you collect data, talk to a statistician, especially if you're going on for master's thesis. Talk to a statistician before you start collecting your data. What typically people do is they collect the data, then go to a statistician and ask, well, what do I do with it? Well, that's kind of after the fact. There's a lot of things you could do if you had the data. If you talk to them before you collect the data, maybe they'll give you some ideas. And here's an example. I've got 10 capacitors. I collected some data, found the mean, standard deviation, sample size, that's all I kept. I threw out all the rest of the data. That's all I have to work with. In that case, I basically come up with a conclusion, uh, not really. There's not really much of an effect with polarity. However, if I were to take the capacitance and note which one was forward biased, which one was reverse biased, I have another way to analyze the data. I can take each of these, find the difference, with the difference, find the mean, find the standard deviation. Um, so on average, the capacitor loses 0 0.1130 nanofarads when I flip it around, make it reverse biased, with the standard deviation of 0 0.05. I can do a t-test with this data. That's your W. If I look at W, A minus B, the t-score is minus 2.05. That means that this tail over here, A bigger than B, is 3.5%. This is 96.5%. That's for an individual. 
So 96% of the time for any capacitor, if I flip the polarity, I'm going to lose capacitance. It's there. I can see it. If I look at it in terms of population, this says, on average, do I lose capacitance? And I'm 6.4 standard deviations out. So now the right tail is 0 0.00006. The left tail is 99.994%. I can sure see that. This is where the term statistical significance is different than the English word significance. Statistical significance says I can see the difference. If I run the experiment this way, I keep track of every individual capacitor forward and reverse, then each capacitor on average loses capacitance, or it's highly likely that I will lose capacitance, 96% chance. For the population, on average, I most certainly do lose capacitance. I'm 99.9994% certain that I lose capacitance. That is statistically significant. A different question, is it significant in terms of circuit design? Again, note, I'm losing 0.1 nanofarad out of 390. Uh, do I care? That's a different question. That's not what this class is about statistics. Statistics says, can I see the difference? And sure enough, I can. Are electrolytic capacitors polarized? Uh, again, do the same experiment. With electrolytic capacitors, I used a 1,000 or 1 microfarad, 1,000 nanofarad capacitor. On these, they've got a little stripe saying this is your negative. So here's your minus side. Here's your plus polarity. The capacitance is 1 microfarad with the correct polarity. Um, usually no guarantee and correct polarity. Does polarity matter? Again, same experiment. I'll take 10 of these measure the capacitance with the correct polarity, measure capacitance with the incorrect polarity, find the mean, find the standard deviation, sample size. Here again, if all I did is record the mean, standard deviation, and sample size, then throw out the rest of the data, I can analyze it. I'm comparing 1,004 versus 1,005 nanofarads. The difference is 1.39 nanofarads. The variance is 16 nanofarads. So here's forward, here's reversed. When I flip the capacitor around, there is a difference. It's pretty subtle, but it is there. If I convert that to a probability, it's 46%. Basically 50-50. Um, which polarity it is doesn't have a huge impact. Or if I know the capacitance, I've got basically a 50-50 shot figuring out whether it's forward or, or reverse biased. If I take the sample size into account, look at the population, then the t-score is minus 0.23, or a 40% chance. Meaning, if I have a population of transistor or population of capacitors, I can tell you which population belongs to with 60% certainty, and a little bit better than 50-50. It's not a whole lot. Basically saying there's not a huge difference between forward and reverse bias in terms of the capacitance, for these 1,000 microfarad capacitors. OK, got that out. Let's look at individuals. If I were to keep the data, again, capacitor 1, capacitor 2, which ones are which? Now, for individuals, take the difference. Here's the change in capacitance. The change has a mean standard deviation. Is that statistically significant? Well, to analyze that, I'll take the difference. It's got a mean standard deviation from your t-score. That's 1.97 standard deviations. But the tail has 3.9% area. So this tail is 3.9%. Uh, this side is 96.1%. So for any individual capacitor, 96% certainty I've got less capacitance if I use the correct polarity than incorrect. If I look at the population, does the capacitance change overall when I flip the polarity? Here you take the standard deviation, divide by the square root of sample size, since they're both 10 and 10. The t-score is 6.25. So now for the population, I'm 99.9993% certain. 
basically saying that there is a statistical, statistically significant difference in the capacitance, forward and reverse biased. A question whether that is significant in terms of circuit design is a different question. Again, I'm looking at one nanofarad out of a thousand. You know, probably doesn't make a difference. Statistics says I can see it. It may not matter in your circuit design, but I can measure it. That's what stati statistical significance means. Another question you can ask, what about temperature? And this I kind of noticed that if you take a capacitor and measure it, the capacitance changes, it drips on you. And it had me thinking, is it the warmth of my fingers that are changing the capacitance? So let's do a test on that. Let's test the capacitors at 83 Fahrenheit. I'll then take the capacitors, stick them in ice water, and then stick it in the 555 timer, measure the frequency, calculate the capacitance. So here's the data at 83 Fahrenheit, the temperature in my office. I like it warm. The capacitance when I cool it down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, how you collect the data makes a difference. If all I do is keep track of the mean and standard deviation, I'll just use these numbers. In that case, W again is A minus B. Here's the mean of W. Uh, here I'll just do populations. The variance, standard deviation of the population, the T-score is 1.13. So it's 85% likely that temperature does matter for an individual capacitor. Or in other words, if I just pick one capacitor, 85% of the time the capacitance will in this case, decrease as I cool it down. That's for an individual capacitor. In terms of population, not correction, that's for the population. I'll get these in here. That's a population study. So again, this says I'm 85% certain that temperature does affect capacitance. That's if I just look at the mean standard deviation. If I look at each individual capacitor, can go back over here, look at each one, take the difference. Now the difference has a mean standard deviation. If I analyze it that way, uh, the mean is 2.2, standard deviation for the population is 0.07, the t-score is 31. 31 is a huge number. Basically here's your PDF, here's zero. Uh, yeah, there is a big difference between 70 or 83 degrees Fahrenheit and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. I can definitely see it. Again, this the question of whether that's significant is different than whether it's statistically significant. Statistically significant says, uh, yeah, there's a huge, huge difference between the two. I can sure see it. Significant just means, do I care about two nanofarads out of a thousand? Does that affect circuit design? So kind of in summary, with a t-test, I can compare two populations. The trick is to create a new variable w that's a minus b. And what I do is I try to determine the probability that w is bigger than zero. And there's kind of two ways to do it. So this is w, a minus b. It's got a mean, and you've got zero somewhere. I want to find out how far zero is from the mean. I can do that for individuals or populations. With individuals, I just take the standard deviation that you calculate. If it's a population, I divide by, I divide by the sample size for the variance and then take the square root. And likewise for B, If NA and NB are the same, I can pull it outside. But this is the general formula. A second thing to note is when you collect your data, keep all the data. It's much easier having too much data and not using it than trying to recreate the data after the fact. And there might be some ways to look at the data that you hadn't thought of, such as in this case, rather than just, just taking the overall mean standard deviation, if I take each individual one separately, I can see differences that I couldn't see otherwise.
And another thing to note is this really only works with two populations. T-test really works with one population. I can turn it into two populations, or I can handle two populations by taking the difference. If I have more than two populations, I kind of struggle. That'll be the next lecture when we look at what happens when you have two more, more than two populations. There's also another tool you can use called analysis of variance. Basically, there are tons and tons and tons of tests you can use in statistics. T-test is really designed for single population, though. So that is lecture number 20 for part one, 24A, for ECE 341 random processes.